And certainly they have a lot to talk about. Thank you, Bill. Of course, the Democrat who has dominated the news this week is not the nominee, but the Reverend Jesse Jackson. And today, his campaign continued at full speed, as did the question, what specifically does Jesse Jackson want? What do we really want? We want to win in November. This from the man who some suggest is a spoiler for stealing all the thunder, grabbing all the attention from what is supposed to be a Dukakis convention, for refusing to fold his second place tent quietly. On this, the day presidential nominee Michael Dukakis arrives in town. Ain't nobody scared of Dukakis. We want what's ours. Jesse Jackson has a right because he's earned for somebody to pay attention to him. He keeps saying he's earned consideration, inclusion, and he says he's fighting within the system. We will use every rule within our convention to make room for our constituency. Constituency, as well as all the rest of the Democrats in this town, are watching very, very carefully to see when the meeting between the two men is going to take place. There are no shortcuts. No one else can solve the problems between the two men. The hopeful sign is that both sides are still saying they hope that that meeting will come off, and it will come off soon. If not today, then probably tomorrow. Susan? Thank you, Betsy. Of course, the last two days have seen countless hours of meetings, tense negotiations between the Dukakis and Jap Jackson camps, aimed at heading off confrontation on the floor and problems further down the line. Bruce Morton has a report. There is no such thing as automatic unity or unanimity in the Democratic Party. The mayor of Atlanta had a point there. There can be no final resolution until there is mutual trust and respect and a feeling of comfort. Brown and others from the Jackson and Dukakis campaigns met for several hours today and said nothing when the meeting ended. There will be no comment. The best case scenario is that uh, Jesse Jackson and Michael Dukakis meet and stop using those of us who are serving. Most people think that will happen and that the basic disagreement over Jackson's role won't be settled until it does. Jackson, as always, spoke with passion here today, but you could read his words several different ways. I want no job. That's right. For pay, I want no title. I want a supportive role commensurate with reasonable expectations of my work and my constituency. Yeah. In Washington, Lloyd Benson said he hoped there wouldn't be a floor fight for the vice presidential nomination, but... What if, uh, if uh, the Jackson forces decide to take it into a drag-out battle? How, how would you feel about that? Well, then you just have it. But uh, I don't think we're going to have to face that. And while that was going on, the big story of the day, hundreds of other things were happening too. Bands practiced. Conventions are like class reunions, a chance to meet old friends, a chance for musicians to strut their stuff. Well, guess what? The, the speech is finished. For keynote speakers, conventions can be a leap to stardom or a step back. And while all of that was going on, some young people practiced some important words. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Indivisible. That's how the Democrats would like to look when it all ends Thursday night. But there are problems. Michael Dukakis's problem is that the convention should focus on him, the nominee. So far, it has focused on Jesse Jackson and his demands instead. But Jackson has problems, too. One is that the nominating process does not reward second-place finishers. Close only counts in horseshoes, not politics. And Jackson has another problem. You can end a campaign, but how, if it is in your blood, do you end a crusade? Susan? Thank you, Bruce. The two camps inside the hall worked for peaceful resolution, but violence erupted this afternoon outside the hall as white supremacists clashed with anti-Klan demonstrators who, in turn, clashed with the police. Peter Van Zant reports. A planned march by less than 100 Ku Klux Klan and white supremacist followers in Atlanta didn't take a single step this afternoon after hundreds of anti-Klan demonstrators confronted police at the state capitol where the Klan planned to gather. What was to be an anti-Klan demonstration turned into a show of rage against Atlanta police who pushed the demonstrators back but arrested no one. I don't fully understand what's going on here, so I can't respond to it. 
All we want to make sure is that this thing uh, is handled uh, peacefully and that there are no problems. People under the Constitution have the right to assemble. We're going to assemble and we're going to march. But with the streets out of control, police didn't allow the two opposing groups to get near each other. With the anti-Klan, anti-police demonstrators controlling the Capitol, the city decided to cancel the Klan's parade permit, leaving them stuck in this parking lot. They said they could protect them, but they couldn't protect us. We, we just as got much right as they have. You know, give us automatic weapons, and when it's over with, man, they can pick up the pieces, and they won't have to have any damn police in Atlanta. Late this afternoon, several white supremacists went to the convention center to try to speak to arriving delegates, but opponents attacked the marchers, leaving them bloodied and beaten. The delegates were never threatened, but for a time, angry demonstrators ruled the streets. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Atlanta. A gas leak is still threatening to delay the first post-Challenger space shuttle flight, but NASA announced today that despite the problem, it will go ahead and test Shuttle Discovery's main engines next week as scheduled. Coming up next on the CBS Evening News, South Africa and the birthday that could not be celebrated. And later on Inside Sunday from Atlanta, the song of the South, how the tune is changing. Four off-duty U.S. servicemen in Honduras were wounded early today by unidentified attackers using guns and explosive devices. The men, who were not in uniform, are stationed at Palmarola Air Base. They are all in good condition. Nelson Mandela turns 70 tomorrow in a South African jail, a prisoner now for a quarter century. The white minority government is not about to allow any parties, as we hear from Martha Teichner. London's 70th birthday rally for Nelson Mandela was an index of how powerful a symbol the jailed leader of the outlawed African National Congress is worldwide in the struggle against apartheid. We, all of us, the world, needs Nelson Mandela. Do you agree? Today, in this park near Soweto, South Africa's largest black township, there would have been thousands of people attending a birthday concert. Except that here, all public celebrations of Nelson Mandela's birthday have been banned, and their organizers hauled in by police. There was supposed to be an all-day rally at Cape Town's University of the Western Cape, but instead today the campus was blocked off by armored vehicles. Yesterday, five joggers wearing Mandela t-shirts set off on what they called a freedom run. What happened to them is just one reflection of the South African government's paranoia over anything at all to do with Nelson Mandela, a man who has been the government's own prisoner for more than 25 years. After being tracked by a police helicopter, the runners were taken into custody. In a real sense, I suppose that what has been happening yesterday and today uh, in Cape Town and uh, all over the country is probably the greatest tribute paid to Mandela. One of the few celebrations that has actually taken place was an impromptu gathering in the cramped backyard of the Mandela home in Soweto. 50,000 birthday cards from the people of Holland were delivered to Nelson Mandela's wife, Winnie. World champion boxer Mike Tyson sent his gloves for Mandela, who was once an amateur boxer himself. The Mandela family has refused an offer to let them all spend an unprecedented six hours together at the prison tomorrow on Nelson Mandela's actual birthday. They said they wanted no special favors from the government that has jailed him for life. Martha Teichner, CBS News, Johannesburg. There was a mass rally in Soviet Armenia today, the eve of a special meeting of top Moscow officials, including Mikhail Gorbachev. The Presidium of the Supreme Soviet will consider Armenian demands to annex part of neighboring Azerbaijan. The Democratic Convention this week has put a spotlight on Atlanta and on the entire South. Tonight on Inside Sunday, a look at the region and how it's changing, the people, their politics, the landscape. Politically, Southerners are, Southerners are growing more independent and much less predictable. Spanish moss, lazy tugboats, sultry afternoons. Georgia's first district in the southeast corner of the state is every non-Southerner's idea of the sleepy South. 
But when it comes to picking presidents, this district is anything but sleepy. Except for 1980, when native son Jimmy Carter squeaked by, the first has voted for the winner in every election since 72, most of them Republicans. My district, I don't think, puts a big uh, focus on party labels. The solid Democratic South, I believe, as far as national elections concerned, uh, is no more. That's the Democrats' dilemma, because the South may well mean the election. In the bellwether first, as throughout the region, the challenge is to motivate black voters, Jackson supporters, while wooing back conservatives, many of whom voted for Reagan. Democrats, like Dr. Leon Curry. Frankly, at this time, I'm, I'm leaning a little bit towards George Bush. Dr. Curry says the Democrats may just be too liberal for the South, that Jesse Jackson's influence has him worried. Just because Jesse Jackson is Jesse Jackson doesn't give him any privilege any more so than any other candidate might have had. And I think he presses his case pretty hard. The conservatives here grudgingly concede that the choice of fellow conservative Lloyd Benson for vice president has made Dukakis somewhat easier to take. But the very same move has left black Democrats feeling abandoned and frustrated. We don't have no place else to go but to Dukakis. Elijah Hall likes Jackson's views, wanted him on the ticket, even though he felt that probably that would have doomed it. Now he says he's just confused. Kind of like the man was when he watched his mother-in-law drive his new Cadillac, Cadillac off the 100-foot cliff. He was glad to see his mother-in-law gone, but he didn't want to lose his Cadillac, see? It's the question of whether or not uh, the uh, black voters do turn out and vote. I think if they stay home because Jesse's not on the ticket, then I don't think uh, we can make it in November. But nor can they make it if conservatives defect to Bush. The trick will be walking that fine line between the old South and the new. Right now, like the choir, they don't know what the future holds. One thing we do know about the future of the South is that women are helping to shape it. Southern women are taking an ever more active role in the political process, and as Bruce Hall reports, they are a power to be reckoned with. Make a good look, my dear. It's a historic moment. You can tell your grandchildren how you watched the old South disappear one night. But many of the Democrats are coming to Atlanta, still expecting to see the old South from Gone with the Wind. What they will find is more women like Ann Stallard. Those little halftones look good, don't they? She runs a printing company and has little patience with the Yankee notion of conservative, crinoline-clad maidens in the kitchen. I don't care to serve you the pie. I want to be in on the pie making. Southern women are pretty strong and pretty effective at getting what they want. But I think women are also outraged by the treatment that they've gotten at the hands of all of the presidential candidates this year. Republican George Bush seems to be bearing the brunt of the so-called gender gap. Women throughout the country, and especially Southern women, recognize that George Bush is not going to be an agent for change, and in the clutch, he's not going to be looking out for their interests. See, you know, I'm already on the council, all right? Rose Strong is the exception. Taking matters into her own hand, she ran for political office as a Republican. Hello. This is Rose Strong, and I'm asking for your vote in the... She defeated a male incumbent, is outspoken, recruits blacks for the Republican Party, and is a supporter of George Bush. We're not any longer just satisfied being and going and giving our vote, our block of votes, to one party. We will go, you know, where the best deal is offered. After all, competition is the American way. The challenge for the Republicans is to find more Rose Strongs to carry the cause. But as the Democrats gather here in the heart of the South, they plan to underline their belief that they are the party of the new South and the new Southern woman. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Atlanta. Atlanta and the new South have been growing at an unprecedented rate over the past two decades. Keeping that expansion under control is a hot political issue throughout not just the South, but the entire Sun Belt, as David Dow reports. In many ways, Gwinnett County is the symbol of a booming Atlanta a suburban region of new neighborhoods and new industry with five times the population of just 20 years ago and the traffic to match. Growth in Gwinnett County is synonymous with progress. 
but increasingly it is also cause for concern. The green light is on, but it, there's also a caution light too. Today, Gwinnett County is trying to avoid the problems of other high growth areas, of Southern California, for instance, which has grown faster than its ability to provide public services. Here, the average suburbanite has seen his daily commute time increase 10 minutes in just four years. If we continue our, our business as usual, uh, then over half of all the time that people in this community spend in transportation will be spent in stop and go traffic. We have a disaster on our hands if we don't come to manage our growth problems. Faced with a sewage system so overloaded that it sometimes leaks into Santa Monica Bay, the Los Angeles City Council has sharply limited the number of building permits. It was the latest evidence of a new philosophy gaining strength and respectability throughout Southern California. Slow growth instead of growth. You see this whole canyon? This is going to be filled in. Slow growth was born of the likes of Flora Walker, who fought and won a battle to scale back a housing development planned in the rugged Santa Monica Mountains. The movement is spreading even to conservative Orange County, where a slow growth measure made it to the ballot and received 45% of the vote. And in the city of San Gabriel, voters, angered with growth patterns, enacted a one-year construction moratorium and turned most of the city council out of office. We're not against growth. We understand it is part, a natural part of the evolution of cityhood. But it's important it is a, a growth that is planned. Many say the only answer for big cities like Atlanta and Los Angeles is a regional approach to growth problems. Without that, they say, even the strongest slow growth measure will simply chase the problems across borders, from one community to the next. David Dow, CBS News, Los Angeles. One footnote, it looks like Atlanta, anyway, can expect even more growth. For the third straight year, corporate executives have rated it first among America's 31 largest cities as the best place to locate a business. Thousands of miles from Atlanta, in one tiny island village, Interest in what's happening at the Democratic Convention, and specifically in the fate of Michael Stanley Dukakis, is at fever pitch. This is, after all, a family affair. Alan Pizzi reports. Come November 8th, this sleepy little Greek village is going to come alive. Palopi, population 650, bills itself as the hometown of Michael Dukakis and there's going to be one big party on election day. Dukakis' father left here at the age of 15, but in Palopi, candidate Dukakis is considered a native son. Dukakis spent four hours here in 1976. Today, half the town claims to be related to him. The mayor says he's a third cousin. I don't know how and why we, we have this feeling, but for us it's like if he's already the President of the United States. It's, uh, for us it's a fact. Mayor Stefanu has a few tips for the local hero who would be President. For example, he's big on small government. The mayor has a staff of one. He spends most of his time among his constituents, who spend most of their time doing what men have done in Greek villages for centuries. The mayor is proud of running what might be called a clean administration in a clean town. There may be more donkeys than cars on the main street, but the village operates on a balanced budget. The mayor says taxes are as much an issue in Palopi politics as they are in the U.S. He vows he has no intention of raising the rate. It's already $15 a year. The villagers do anticipate an influx of tourists. Manolis Yakovos is the local celebrity. He bought the Dukakis family house 57 years ago. At least 100 people came to interview me uh, by now, and, and, and God knows how many more will come in the future. Palopians are convinced Dukakis will win. After all, voting day is November 8th, which is also St. Michael's Day and the anniversary of the island's liberation from Turkish occupation. And even if the unthinkable happens and the native son runs second, they'll have a party anyway. Alan Pizzi, CBS News, Palopi, Greece. 
That's the CBS Evening News. Bill Plant will be here with an update on the CBS Sunday Night News. And tomorrow, Dan Rather will be here with our coverage of the Democratic National Convention. I'm Susan Spencer in Atlanta. I'll see you next week. Good night.